Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of AJAC Live Online. My name is Joel Burney. It's fantastic to have you with us this evening. Special mention to our Facebook audience and our international guests. Thank you very much for joining us. As usual, ladies and gentlemen, just some very, very brief housekeeping items from me for tonight. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce our next webinar, which will be with Senior Vice President for the Foundation of Defence of Democracies, Dr. Jonathan Shanza. Jonathan will join us on Wednesday, the 24th of November. So that's next week, Wednesday, the 24th of November at 12.30 p.m. An invitation will be in your inbox very shortly. So that's Dr. Jonathan Shanza next week, Wednesday, 24th of November at 12.30 p.m. As usual tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we, we will be hosting a moderated Q&A. So please have your questions ready and I'll go through the raised hand feature inside Zoom uh, closer to the question and answer time. Uh, and then we'll be able to, to ask David some questions. Now to our main event, David Horowitz is the founding editor of the Times of Israel, the fastest growing current affairs website in the Jewish world with an average of some 8 million monthly users worldwide and 40 million page views. Month, 40 million monthly page views. The Times of Israel, which provides independent non-partisan coverage of Israel, the region and the Jewish world, also publishes in Hebrew, French, Arabic and Persian. He was previously the editor-in-chief of, of the Israeli English language daily, the Jerusalem Post, before stepping down in July 2011 after almost seven years, an editor and publisher of the award-winning news magazine, The Jerusalem Report. Horowitz has written from Israel for newspapers around the world, including the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Irish Times, and the London Independent. He's a frequent interviewee on CNN, the BBC, Sky, Fox News, NPR, and other TV and radio stations. Horowitz is the author of 2004's Still Life with Bombers, Israel in the Age of Terrorism, and 2000's A Little Too Close to God, The Thrills and Panic of Life in Israel, both published in the US by NOM. He edited and co-wrote the Jerusalem Report's 1996 biography of Yitzhak Rabin, Shalom Friend, which was published in 12 countries and won the U.S. National Jewish Book Award for nonfiction. He was the recipient of the 2005 JDC Award for Journalism on Israel and Diaspora Affairs and is a previous winner of the B'nai B'rith World Center Award for Journalism. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening's topic is Assessing the Bennett Lapid Government and Prospects for 2022. I would now like to hand over to Ajax Executive Director, Dr. Colin Rubenstein, to say a few words. Thanks very much, Joel. Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all, and in particular to welcome our very distinguished guest of honour this evening, the very astute, very perceptive and widely respected commentator and journalist, David Horowitz. Pressing issues uh, on the agenda. And who better than our guest of honor tonight to uh, assess where Israel is in terms of domestic issues, in terms of regional and international issues. First and foremost, of course, now that the budget has been passed in Israel for quite a while, but how will that affect the coalition government? Will it hold together now that it's got a budget? We'd like David's opinion on how the members of the government are performing. How's the prime minister, Naftali Bennett, doing? How's the foreign minister? And perhaps next Prime Minister, Yair Lapid, how's Defence Minister Benny Gantz performing? Uh, and are there any other stars that have emerged from this government or indeed others not performing very well, maybe even duds, to use a cruel term? And particularly, uh, what's the inclusion of the Arab Party, the Ram Party, Mansour Abbas? How are they faring and how significant is that? domestically and internationally in terms of the image and performance of Israel. And indeed, on the opposition side of the ledger, what's happened to uh, uh, former Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu and the Likud that he leads? Are they OK? Are they flourishing? Or is Bibi on the way out? What is the future there? What's happening with uh, his trial? And so on. And uh, that's without even mentioning the regional and foreign affairs dimensions of Israel's situation. Are the Abraham Accords solid? Are they flourishing? Are there newcomers who are likely uh, to join Libya, uh, where one hears whispers of Saudi Arabia, uh, perhaps uh, on the perimeters there getting serious? 
the big one, of course, is uh, relations with uh, the United States and the President Biden. Uh, how's that going? Uh, the idea of a Palestinian consulate in Jerusalem opening up? Problematic, obviously, from Israel's point of view. Uh, the impact of the post-Afghanistan uh, withdrawal, the debacle of that uh, yeah, withdrawal and the implications of it, one of which is probably to reboot international terrorism for another decade, unfortunately. And the big one that's looming very, very quickly is uh, Iran and uh, the nuclear file and the nuclear issue. Will the United States stay strong or is it caving in and, and creating a devilish problem for Israel and indeed for the Sunni Arab countries uh, who also are very concerned about the Iranian uh, threat? Uh, and domestically, of course, we've got ongoing pressing issues day to day. The Sheikh Jarrah uh, issue, uh, we've just seen Israel prescribe six uh, Palestinian NGOs, uh, Defence Minister Gantz, how's that going? Plus, plus, plus. Uh, I could go on and you don't want to hear from me tonight. We want to hear from our distinguished guest, David Horowitz, assessing the Bennett Lapid government and indeed uh, trying to calculate what the prospects for 2022 are. David, over to you and welcome. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Joel. Hello, everybody. Um, well, that was good, Colin, because if I answer all of your questions as quickly as I can, we'll, we'll be through in two, three hours, no problem. Um, I'm, but I'm going to try, okay? And then you guys will ask me things that I didn't touch on. Um, first, I have to say, I'm speaking to you from my office in central Jerusalem, which is next door to the YMCA. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day and as somebody who spent the first 20 years of my life in London, I ought to be delighted, but I'm not because after about 30 years in Israel, I started to actually like it when it rained. It takes a long time to get that Britishness out of you and we need it to rain. Uh, where are we now? Mid-November. I know it's all different where you are in the world, but it ought to be raining a lot and it isn't. So when you're doing your tefillot, you're, when you're doing your, your prayers, add in a little prayer for, for, uh, for some rain. It's not disastrous yet, but it's not good. Um, so um, I'll start with, uh, I guess, your, your, uh, your main inquiries there. Um, I live in this incredible country uh, with its astoundingly vibrant democracy. Uh, it got a little too vibrant in the last few years in that we, uh, we went through a series of elections, as you know, four elections in two years. You know, it's an incredibly good system in that every vote counts. Uh, we have pure proportional representation, as you know, and we're a very divided people. I'm not sure the divides are as wide as they always were on everything, but we couldn't elect uh, decisively a, a coalition government here. We've never had single party government. The votes split among many parties and election after election, we couldn't do it until June. Uh, so in June, um, uh, through the most implausible coalition, I would say in Israeli history, really put together by Yair Lapid, uh, but put together in a way that Naftali Bennett got to go first as prime minister, as you, as you say, Colin, the, the intended next prime minister is Lapid a couple of years from now. Uh, we got this eight party coalition government. Uh, we thought that they would be elected by, by what we believed would be the closest possible margin. We thought they'd win a vote of confidence 61 to 59 in the Knesset. 120 seats in the, in the parliament. We thought it would go 61-59. In the end, it actually went 60-59 because one of the coalition members abstained. Uh, so you couldn't have had a more narrow process by which a new government was uh, sworn into office. And that, of course, was big test one for this coalition. But as you rightly say, we now have a budget and that involved passing big test two. I, I won't get into the minutiae, but you're welcome to ask me. They needed to pass this budget by November the 14th. In fact, they passed it 10 days early. It's the first time since 2018 that Parliament passed a budget. So we had a budget for 2019, passed in 2018. And since then, we worked on a kind of proportionate monthly allocation based on that prioritization of resources from three years ago until just a few days ago when they passed both the 2021 budget for the last few weeks of this year so they could do some adjustments and the 2022 budget. If they hadn't have passed the 2021 budget, the Knesset would have automatically dispersed. We would have had new elections. So this was a huge test and there were literally hundreds of clauses and objections and the government had to navigate them all with this 61-59 majority. They did it. There was only one instance when a Labour Knesset member hit the wrong button, voted with the opposition by mistake. 
the, the clause in question, irrelevant what the clause was, had to go back to committee, get approved again, and then they went back to the main parliamentary plenum to vote it through again. That took a few hours. So you can imagine if anywhere during these hundreds of clauses, uh, anyone had voted with the opposition or people had, had got, gotten sick and not been in the chamber. I mean, the potential for disaster was ever present for, for basically two, three days. They got through it, they passed the budget. And that was the, the, the second big test after that initial vote of confidence for this coalition. And it means that they're, they're as safe really as, as they allow themselves to be. The opposition would have a much harder time now bringing them down. You would actually need 61 votes against to get them uh, um, defeated in a, in, in, a, in, a confident, in a no confidence vote. And therefore their own worst enemy potentially is, is themselves. Uh, it's, it's a coalition that runs the spread from firm right wing, three, three parties on the right, pro-settlement parties to give you a sense of their, of their political stances. That's Bennett's own Yamina, Gidon Saar's new right, and Avigdor Lieberman's Israel Beitenu, um, all the way across to Labour and the most left-wing Zionist party in Israeli politics, Meretz, which again, to, to highlight the, the, the diversity, firmly anti-settlement, with the additional unprecedented situation of having a four-member Islamic Arab party, Ra'am, as you mentioned, um, that, uh, uh, that I, I say unprecedented, not the first time there's been an Arab party in government, although it had been many years since then, um, but the first time that a, an Arab party has been essential to the survival of a government. It, you know, it's an integral part of this government without which the government would not exist. So, so you have, on, on almost every major issue, you have potential for immense disagreement among these partners in government. And the ethos that uh, Prime Minister Bennett um, set out, and Lapita said the same thing from the get-go, was that you know we're going to have to put aside some of our most cherished ideological goals because otherwise we're not going to be able to govern. We're only going to be able to govern by consensus, and therefore the focus has been, and the declared focus has been, to try and sort of heal some of the internal rifts that they argued were were if not caused, then certainly worsened in, in the Netanyahu years. We had 12 consecutive years of Netanyahu as prime minister, and the Bennett-Lapid line has been, yeah, we're going to disagree about lots of stuff, but there's a lot of national healing that has to happen. We have to make sure that we work for the good of the Israeli public, <clears throat> and we are, we are required, we are limited by the reality of our politics to only move ahead on issues of consensus. Now, you might say, well, that means they're going to get nothing done. Or you might say, well, maybe because they can't tear themselves apart in theory about divisive issues, they could actually do some national healing. I think it's too early to say. I think some of the, um, the tests really come now because the budget is passed. They knew they were doomed if they couldn't keep it together through the budget. Now they're only doomed if they, if they bring themselves down. So this is really now the big test. Um, and we'll see. A lot of the comments are, a lot of the things that they are saying are encouraging, but, but they haven't really been tested. Now, now, another, this again comes to something you already mentioned. You know, one of the, one of the main factors, I would say, that has kept them together has been the knowledge that they're, that they're doomed if they're apart. And also that the one cause that brought them together, the desire, the national imperative, to quote Gidon Saar, our, our justice minister, uh, to, to rid Israel of Netanyahu as prime minister. Now, so long as Netanyahu is still it, leading the opposition, leading the fight to oust them, I think it becomes easier for them or it stays relatively straightforward for them to keep it together. I think their troubles, and I don't think this is a particularly original thought, um, their troubles begin to multiply if, for example, Netanyahu were to say, okay, I've had my time, I'm in my early 70s, I'm on trial in three corruption charges, which of course I insist are fabricated and I've done no wrongdoing, but I'll step back. I'll step back and I'll, I'll bow to the sense in my own party, by the way, that without me leading the Likud, Likud can come back into power um, and, uh, and, and, and take a share at least of Israel's leadership and be well poised to win future elections. Netanyahu is not doing that. I don't see any signs that Netanyahu wants to do that. Netanyahu has always, um, uh, I think always as, as Israel's leader, been convinced that the country is in terrible trouble without him. I'm sure that's what he feels now. Uh, there, are, there are no signs that he's slowing down in any dramatic way. He's incredibly uh, um, torn because he has got this trial to focus on. 
but he's performing effectively. Uh, he's held his party together. He's held the opposition together and they're doing well in the polls. Now, our polls are utterly unreliable, but if you want to take them as some kind of, you know, not particularly credible barometer, they show it could stronger than it was in the last elections, uh, unable still uh, to form a coalition of its current allies, but still strongest, the biggest party by a considerable distance. And therefore, I don't, I don't see Netanyahu easily stepping aside. And if he doesn't step aside, then it becomes easier for the coalition to hold together to prevent him returning from power. That's the situation as of Monday morning Israel. You know, things move very fast here, but that's the way things look at the moment. You asked about star ministers and dud ministers. I like that, Colin. Um, you know, there's so many of them, for goodness sake. This is the biggest coalition for decades, I think possibly even in, in, in Israel's history, um, a function of the complications of putting together a, a coalition of eight parties. I'm sure there are several duds, uh, but it's probably too early to call them out just now. Uh, they're being tested all the time. We have a major crisis at the moment where a, a couple, a married couple, both of whom are bus drivers for Eged, um, were in the way tourists do, relatively unremarkably, it would seem, uh, on holiday in Turkey and took pictures of a palace used by President Erdogan. Um, they were arrested and they're being held. They've been detained for 20 days. They haven't been charged, um, but they're facing potential charges. And if they're charged with espionage, this becomes a major diplomatic incident. Erdogan hasn't spoken on this issue. Now, we don't quite know what's going on. We know that there have been quite credible rumors of ill health um, in, in the case of Erdogan. We know that in the Knesset just a few days ago, as has often happened in the past, a bill was put forward under which Israel would recognize the Armenian genocide. Uh, th these bills have never been voted through because Israel has, has prioritized, I, I would say, its relations with Turkey over its desire to pass that legislation. Uh, it may be that the Turks thought that with the opposition ready to join up in any way that embarrasses the government and parties like Meretz very committed to this particular legislation. Maybe Turkey thought Israel is about to pass that legislation and this is connected, or maybe it has nothing to do with anything. We don't know yet, but this is a big test for, for Bennett. Can he get uh, this couple, um, who it should be stressed, Israel insists have no, um, are doing nothing for any Israeli agency, any spy agency, they're innocent citizens. Uh, to use the, the words that uh, Bennett used yesterday, this is a big test for him. Uh, the sense will be, if he fails to extricate them, that he's failed in an area where perhaps Netanyahu would have succeeded. So lots of tests there, including on things like this that, that, that sort of pop up, uh, pop up out of nowhere. Um, in terms of, of regional issues that the government is facing, Rob Malley, who's the American point person on the Iran deal, is in Israel at the moment. Interestingly, as of now, as far as I know, he's not going to be meeting with Bennett. And there's lots of conflicting um, uh, explanations and claims about why that's the case. There are people who are saying that Bennett chose not to meet with him to signal his, the Israeli government's ongoing, this is a Netanyahu mindset and a Bennett mindset, and even a Lapid mindset that says, don't go back to the 2015 deal with Iran. It doesn't stop them closing in on the bomb. Is that why Bennett's not meeting with Mali? Is it Mali who didn't want to meet with Bennett? Not clear. He is meeting with Gantz. He's meeting with the security chiefs. He's not the president. He's not the secretary of state. Uh, protocol does not require that he meets with the prime minister. On the other hand, you might think it would be very important for the prime minister to meet with him. Mali's on a regional trip. He's meeting with other of Israel's allies in this part of the world. Um, from, from If you knew nothing, you would assume it would be in the prime minister's profound interest to understand every nuance of what's playing out here. So it's curious and interesting, and it underlines the tension, which has been there for you know certainly the, the last eight years, um, if not longer, as the 2015 deal was taking shape when Netanyahu was challenging Obama openly over it, spoke in Congress against it. We had this very difficult situation where the president of the United States at the time you know, was telling Israel, you don't know what's in the accord, I don't know why you're complaining about it, and then when the deal was done, there's no deal that would have satisfied you, which is not, not the Israeli sense at all. The desire in Israel was for a deal that credibly kept Iran from the bomb, that dismantled their program, and the 2015 didn't, deal didn't do that. And therefore, there are Israelis, including credible figures in the security establishment, who think no deal is worse than this poor deal, but I think it's fair to say that there's a pretty wide sense, 
has been for a long time in Israel, that this was a poor deal uh, and that a better deal is needed if there is to be a deal that, that Iran outsmarted the United States and that almost unfathomably, uh, the United States is now going back into a deal that the Biden administration itself it implicitly acknowledges is poor because it explicitly states that a longer and stronger deal is required. Well, how are you going to get a longer and stronger deal if you're pleading with the Iranians to come back to the existing lousy deal? So that's uh, uh, the sense that plays out here in Israel. And again, coming to the questions that you asked, Colin, at a time when some of the signs are that the United States is, is pivoting away, disengaging somewhat from this region out of Afghanistan, uh, not clear what, uh, what, may, what, what may play out in Iraq. Now, we, you know, this is not good for Israel. Uh, as far as the Israeli sense is, a stronger United States in this part of the world discourages dangerous players. It's much better for Israel to have a strong US in the Middle East, much better for the United States. You know, Iran has Israel within missile range. It is expanding its missiles to bring Europe and the United States into range. We're just the little Satan. Iran is the big Satan. So there are, there are major differences and disagreements between Israel and the United States about how to handle Iran. They're playing out less bitterly and less publicly than they did between the Netanyahu government and the Obama government, for example. They're there. They're just being handled a little more discreetly and politely. Uh, but the stakes are, if anything, even higher. Iran is closer to the bomb than it was. It can enrich further and faster. Its missile development is further ahead. Uh, we still don't think that there, there's no intimations, we are told, uh, high in the security apparatus here, no intimations that Iran is, is seeking to break out, about to break out, but a concern that the breakout time uh, you know, is potentially shorter. Uh, there's still some hurdles, some major technical hurdles. They are not weeks away. Uh, from the bomb, they, they, they're, as far as I can understand, certainly many months away in the worst case scenario from the capacity uh, to, to reach a nuclear weapons capability. But they are, you know, they, they are, they're, they're, their capabilities, their abilities, their knowledge, um, some of the technical aspects, some of the practical uh, elements further along than they were when the argument was playing out more openly, but the argument is still there. And that's, I think, the main challenge that in terms of foreign policy, regional policy that this government is facing. I don't see anybody about to join the Abraham Accords. Colin, again, in answer to another of your questions, uh, there have been, uh, there are ongoing contacts, certainly with the Saudis um, at unofficial levels. Uh, there was, uh, there are some interesting visitors, including from Libya, uh, the, the ties that we have are warming overtly all the time. Israel is at the Dubai um, uh, uh, Expo at the moment. Uh, the Israeli Air Force chief is in the Emirates at the moment. We had a drill last week for the first time that included Bahrain, a naval drill, and the UAE and the United States. There's talk of a potential air drill with those players, again, with Iran very much in mind. So, you know, you, you don't have merely papers that were signed in um, war heartwarming ceremonies at the White House. You have actual practical cooperation uh, including against the shared threat of Iran, and you see the, the cooperation deepening. Uh, and you see the players in those existing accords, most notably the Emirates, I would say, um, uh, at signaling that they want warm peace. This is not the, 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 the angst-filled uh, honeymoon over ties, the very important ties nonetheless with, with Jordan and, and Egypt. Uh, this is th these are warm relations that we have with the UAE and with Bahrain and the revival of a relationship with Morocco, where, of course, there's a, a vibrant Jewish community. And that was the sort of consummation of what were already and had been in the past, you know, very formal uh, ties. So we, we, all of those relations are warming. Um, you know, I, I'll shut up in a minute. I, I mentioned the, um, the, 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 the issue of Turkey. That's a, a relationship that's under strain. Uh, not clear where we're heading on that. In terms of some of the domestic issues, very quickly, and then I'll shut up. Um, I think somebody very interesting to watch, who I certainly don't think is a dud, um, is the Minister of Religious Services. His name is Matan Kahana. Uh, those many of you on this call who are pretty familiar with Israel will know that um, Jewish life in the public sphere in Israel down the decades has become, has always been the monopoly of the Orthodox, but has become the preserve of the ultra-Orthodox in recent decades. The rabbinate has increasingly had uh, been dominated by uh, ultra-Orthodox rabbis and politicians. You know that life cycle events in Israel uh, um, are, um, are 
the preserve of the of the orthodox you can't basically be born married divorced or die here without um, uh, orthodox rabbis signing off on this and now for the first time in a long time you have a minister of religious services who is not ultra orthodox he's modern orthodox he's very from he's a poster boy for religious zionism to quote something he said to to me and my colleague tal schneider when we interviewed him just a few days ago uh, and he's revolutionizing for the time being I would say Jewish life in the public sphere in Israel. He's privatized uh, the process of kashrut supervision. Uh, he says to the benefit of the ultra orthodox, who, who are you going to go for? Who are you going to go to for your kashrut certificate? The most stringent authority, if you have a choice, because then everyone will eat your food, right? If you're a restaurant or a manufacturer. So he says that doesn't harm the ultra orthodox. He's now entering the conversion world, where again those were the two issues where the coalition parties agreed he could act. Um, uh, by consensus. So he's trying to encourage the hundreds of thousands of Israeli citizens eligible to live here under the law of return, but not halakhically Jewish. He wants to make it easier for them to convert through the Orthodox, as opposed to a terrible struggle and being basically sent away by the rabbinate. But beyond that, he wants to, you know, he says he feels that Jewish life in Israel, the Jewish identity of Israel has been diluted over the decades. He says the country, if you like, was frumer in its early years. There was no cinemas open on Shabbat. There were no places of entertainment, uh, no, no, uh, no shopping on the Shabbat. He kind of wants us to get, he wants to get us back there. So it's not like he's diluting Israel's Jewish character in any way, but he would argue he's being pragmatic about some aspects of it. Here's a really key one, which I think is, you know, will be very interesting, even at the expense of me speaking for a long time. Um, because if you don't serve in the army as an ultra orthodox young man, you're not really allowed to enter the workforce because if you didn't take the burden and, and responsibilities of national service, you shouldn't be allowed to, 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 to enter the workforce. The way it has worked until now, you have to be 24 at a minimum. If you didn't do your army service, you can't really get a job until you're 24. He's lowering that. The government's lowering that. They're on the way to lowering that to 21. Bennett has said that may not be fair. To, to the Israelis who do, do share that burden, but it's wise because, and Kahana says the same thing, you'll then have more ultra-Orthodox people joining the workforce, finding a way to coexist with the rest of society. And then maybe, first of all, they'll, they'll, they'll train and, and get jobs and, and be less impoverished as a community. And they'll want to encourage younger siblings maybe to join the army because they'll be more at ease with the interaction. With the provision, he stresses, that there are army frameworks that allow ultra-Orthodox recruits to maintain their lifestyle. So this, you, you would think that the ultra-Orthodox leadership would be very happy about all of this. Of course, quite the reverse. They're furious that they've lost their control of that ministry. They loathe him with particular venom, I would say. It's a very interesting process that's playing out. Okay, there's lots of other stuff that I could talk about. Direct me where you'd like to go, and I'll hand this back to you for the time being. I hope that's a, a good initial sense, and you know, now I'll explore wherever you take me. Thank you very much for that, David. Splendid introductory remarks. There was a lot to unpack there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you have a question or two. So you can use the reactions tab on your Zoom. You just hit the reactions button. You'll see a raised hand feature that will provide me with a silent notification of your intent to ask David a question. Uh, or you can use the chat feature. If you are a little bit camera shy and you can type your chat in there uh, and I'll try and get that to David as well. So our first question for tonight will go to Ajax, Dr. S Dr. Svi Fleischer. Thank you, David. That was, that was very enlightening. Um, I want to ask a bit more about the situation for the relations with, between Jewish and Arab Israelis. Um, we've got, as, we, as you noted, we've got this unprecedented situation with the Ram Party being able to bring down the government. But we've also had a, a very bad situation in May where we had unprecedented riots between Jewish and Arab Israelis. Um, and there's a lot of talk about the, the crime situation in Arab municipalities and the efforts to kind of tackle that. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how do you think um, that the relations are, are they, are they improved since May? Um, are, is the government um, likely to making any breakthroughs in um, achieving some of the things Arab Israelis want to see, and how is Ram tra traveling in the Arab community as opposed to uh, in, as a result of their proper submission of the government? Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, so there's lots of questions I can't answer for uh, answer uh, um, at all. Which generally the questions about the future because I I kind of know what happened yesterday, barely what happened today, and, and we don't know. So I, I it's hard to predict how how it's hard to get a sense of whether something 
really has changed dramatically for the better in terms of especially May, um, where, where we had really quite horrifying violence, uh, including in, uh, notably including in, in, in mixed Jewish Arab cities like Lod, like Ramleh. Now, um, I mean, Lod especially, for example, has, has been very fraught and very tense for a long time. Um, there's been inadequate funding for much of the Arab sector uh, for many, many decades. There have been governments that did better to address this and, and, and others that did worse. You know, the question is, what, was there some kind of strate strategic shift? Hamas celebrated in May because it argued that it had been able uh, not only to marginalize the Palestinian Authority and spark some protests in the West Bank, there, was, uh, uh, there were protests and violence in, in East Jerusalem around Damascus Gate, and not only at Damascus Gate, they got you know, missiles coming in occasionally from, from Syria, there was, there was friction on the Lebanon border, but the great achievement, the way Hamas saw it, was also being able to spark um, deadly violence, in some cases, within Israel. Um, and, and, you know, while you, you can try to claim that, well, it didn't really have much to do with Hamas, the, you know, the fact is, uh, at that time, at a very fraught period, we had internal violence and confrontation at a, at a degree that we had not known for many, many years. It's very troubling. Um, and then along comes this coalition. Um, and you have for the first time, as I said, and as you rightly say, a, a, a party that is in an Arab party in government, essential to the government's majority and therefore by extension, as every single one of those 61 are, um, capable of causing immense problems and um, until last week, any one of them could have brought down the government. Now you'd need two of them uh, to go over to the other side. Um, and that gives them an incredible position of power, but also gives them an incredible position of potential change. The, the budget, I think, formally begins to address some of that financially. There are allocations of funds. Um, Ram has, been, um, uh, has made an issue, among others, of trying to get more um, uh, legal means to build homes in the Arab sector. It will be championing its sector's interest. Um, and, and it's early days. Uh, they're not doing particularly well to answer another of the, of the questions you raised in, in the polls. Again, be, be wary of the polls, but they certainly haven't shot up. Um, the last poll I saw, they were holding at about four seats. I think they may, I'm not even sure if there was a poll that showed them below. I don't think so, but you can check the polling. It, again, it's incredibly unreliable. Imagine that you're polling a few hundred people and you're trying to, to find the difference between 3%, which is below the threshold, and 4%, which is above the threshold, for, for one of, of, the, of the dozen or so parties that you're polling. You know, one or two responses either way, however you, you do your smart statistical weighing, is going to change your poll. So I wouldn't pay too much heed to it, but I think it's fairly clear, just like it's clear that Bennett's Yamina has not taken off in the polls since he became prime minister. Ram is not performing particularly well. And there's also this, you know, you, you have these, these incredible situations where the cynicism of politics is exposed as if you weren't cynical enough already, where you have the joint list, which is a rival Arab party, but presumably also interested in the well-being of the Arab sector that has been voting with Likud and with the opposition, uh, voted with them on, on many clauses and in, 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 in many acts of legislation in, in recent weeks in order to embarrass Ram. So you have huge friction between the two main Arab political groups, which I, I think probably discredits both of them in the eyes of, the, of their electorate. That's how I would feel about it. Um, so, you know, to sum up, I would say early days, I don't think anyone would say to you, Tzvi, that they are confident that if there were to be another major flare up with, between Israel and Gaza, between Israel and the West Bank, I don't think anyone would say, well, we know that the danger of major friction between Jews and Arabs inside Israel has passed. I think they would say we're more aware of the dangers. I think the police would say we, we are um, more capable of deploying more rapidly. But I don't think, it, and, and I think they would say, and we would hope that some lessons have been learned, but, but it, with their hands on their heart, I don't think they would say more than that. And just one last thing in terms of crime, you know, you can read some of the coverage at one of, one of our reporters, Aaron Boxman, a few months ago, wrote a piece um, setting out the degree to which it's kind of mafiosi style violent crime in the Arab sector. Um, you know, you have you have some really terribly dangerous, um, uh, I don't know how you'd call them, and the gangs kind of un understates it, uh, intimidating um, um, networks of criminals who are very, very powerful in the Arab sector. Um, and I know the police are, are making greater efforts. We had the biggest bust of illegal weaponry in possibly in Israeli history last week, 
but it wasn't that big compared to the scale of the illegal weapons in the Arab sector. We have dozens upon dozens of murders, uh, in many cases in broad daylight, uh, and, and, and the, the, the lazy way to characterize them is, is in the Arab sector. Well, yesterday, I'm sure all of you have been to Israel, you know where Emek Rafaim is in the German colony in Jerusalem. There was a murder on a construction site just off Emek Rafaim this time yesterday. Yeah, there was, and it was premeditated. Two guys arrived armed, several shots were fired, one person was killed, and it was the person, apparently, allegedly, who they intended to kill. Uh, so this happened in broad daylight. That's not in the Arab community. It may be a killing that was determined in the Arab community. It happened in the heart of pastoral, of the pastoral German colony. Uh, and therefore, you know, even some of the ways that we uh, describe the, 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 this, this danger are, uh, do not, you know, in a, in a phrase, give the full picture. So it's, it's a very, very serious issue. Uh, the police are trying, the police have been underfunded for a long time, they went two years without a police commissioner. Uh, there was no full-time police commissioner in Israel for, for a couple of years. Uh, in, in, the, in an area where we're really all too expert at the times of Israel, financial crime, um, internet crime, utterly out-resourced and out, outsmarted. And I, I fear that that may be the case in many other sectors. So there's, there's a long way back that the police have to go before they're gonna be able to tackle this as effectively as they need to. I think you know the, the 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 direction may be positive, but there's a long way to go. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you David. I'll now hand over to Dr. Ron Pratt. Thank you, David. Uh, I wanted to ask about the policy towards uh, the Palestinian. We see sort of a two-way street or two different policies. On the other hand, Gantz uh, is meeting with uh, Abu Mazin, giving him support and money. Uh, the Meretz uh, ministers are, are, are meeting with Abu Mazen. They have a, one of the ministers is actually in the uh, uh, donors uh, uh, conference now. And on the other hand, we have uh, Interior Minister Shaked and uh, Prime Minister Bennett saying uh, they will not meet with Abu Mazen. And uh, Lapid and Bennett are clearly saying they disagree with the uh, opening of the US consulate in East Jerusalem. How do you see that uh, policy uh, developing? Is, is it leading to anything or is it just going to remain sort of limited? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's um, very hard to answer because all the elements that you set out um, contribute or highlight the disagreements within the government. I mean, you have merits and I, I'm, I'm not is exactly sure what Labour would say about settlements, generally speaking, but you have merits basically opposing to any expansion, opposed to any expansion of the settlements. I would imagine Labour would, would be particularly opposed to the expansion of or the building of new homes in areas um, beyond the security barrier and outside of the, of the so-called settlement blocks. And you have, as I said at the very beginning, and as you mentioned, uh, Yamina for sure, but also you know, Israel Beitenu and New Hope. You know, Avita Liebman lives in Nokodim. He lives in a, in a West Bank settlement. Uh, and some of the approval processes already by this new government within what has to be seen as consensus, because they went along with it, you know, they, they have advanced building for you know, something like 3,000 homes, not all of them all the way through to the stage of final approval, but some of them. And, uh, and there's friction in the coalition about this. Uh, you know, there are, there are members of Merits who are beyond unhappy. And there would be members of some of those right-wing parties that I mentioned who would find it intolerable if there wasn't some expansion of the settlement. So I'm not saying that that is the issue that's going to cause more friction than others. But it, 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 if you're looking and you're trying to assess, um, you would think that that's an unavoidable um, potential, well, it's, it's, it's certainly an unavoidable source of friction. And the question is whether they can, um, now that they're through the budget, now that their biggest danger is their own disagreements, the, and the question is whether this is going to bring them down, whether they can survive profound, the core ideological differences. That's the point. For a party like Meretz, and, and maybe for a party like Yamina, um, you could argue that this is, a, this is a, a, arguably their core issue or, or aspect of their core issue. So if your core issue is being compromised oh, at both sides of the coalition, at what point you know, do you find that no longer tolerable? Um, one of the, I suppose one of the um, benefits that they have of this sort of duality of, of Bennett Lapid, you know, years of, of political experience and the awareness of the, of the potency of this mine, right? They, they know that they're facing it. They know that if, if this blows up, 
it will doom them. Uh, and therefore, maybe they can somehow sidestep it. And now I'm going in, you know, that you're going to the smallest of nuances. And, you know, this is, this is, I, I don't know this definitively, but if you look, you know, you can see, I'm not sure that in a different coalition, um, and I say this as a commentator, not, not out of knowledge, I'm not sure that Lapid would be taking the exact positions that he's taking. I'm not sure that Bennett would either. You know, I, I think that Bennett clearly in a, in a right wing coalition would be um, would be uh, advancing policies somewhat differently when it go, when it comes to, to the settlement issue and maybe other aspects of the Israel Palestinian relationship it, it, to the right, obviously. And I think the same as regards Lapid. Um, am, am I convinced that Lapid would be as um, strident in opposing the reopening of the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem in a different coalition constellation? I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, for him, it's obviously not uh, an untenable position to oppose the reopening of the consulate, but I think in a different circumstance, he would be more amenable to the idea. I mean, this is, this is a big conflict with the United States. He would want to avoid it if he could, but if it potentially dooms his coalition, you can, you can almost hear the compromises you know, being thought through there. And that, that seems to be what they're doing. In terms of major philosophy, uh, nobody in this coalition wants anything other than uh, for, for, uh, for the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, I've got so many double negatives in here. Let me start and reframe that sentence. Everybody in this coalition uh, uh, wants to avoid an eruption of friction and conflict with the Palestinians. They have very different takes on how to go about doing that. Uh, the notion of trying to manage the conflict uh, would seem to be quite widely supported within this coalition. So at the same time as you have a coalition that is advancing some settlement, as you say again in the question, you do have Gantz uh, talking to the Palestinians, you have ministers meeting with, with Mahmoud Abbas, you have efforts to increase the, the permits for Palestinians to work in Israel, including from Gaza at a very low level, but still you have a change in policy in Gaza um, where money is not being distributed in a way that can easily get to Hamas. The goal has been to make it clearly earmarked and, and, and destined and arriving uh, in the pockets of Palestinians who are impoverished rather than their terrorist government. You know, there are efforts to be a bit smarter here, and there are certainly eff efforts to manage the conflict. But uh, it's, you know, it is the massive uh, 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 potential grenade for this coalition. And you see them gingerly maneuvering and occasionally making um, comments that they perhaps would rather not get out, or in some cases, making comments deliberately so they will get out as they maneuver within this coalition, not quite dooming themselves, but trying to preserve their own ideological priorities. Thank you for that, David. I've actually got a question in the chat, which might segue nicely, uh, just after your comments about the machinations of the Israeli coalition. This one's a question for the internal issues facing the Palestinians. And the question is, what do you think of the PLO Central Committee's demand that Abbas tear up any agreements that recognize Israel? Uh, look, first of all, it's not my expertise, the internal machinations of, of the Palestinian um, organizations, right? I mean, the PLO is demanding something of the, of the PA president, who's the head of the PLO last time I looked. Um, and, you know, the, the, I suspect that there's a lot of grandstanding in some of the statements that are made. The bottom line is, the, the Palestinian leadership under Abbas has been incredibly problematic for Israel, um, that Abbas himself um, has made many, many, galling is not the word for it, um, statements and speeches, um, essentially denying the Jewish connection to Israel and uh, re misrepresenting Israel as some kind of colonial project, uh, Zionism as a colonial project unrelated to the Jews. Uh, and, and having said that, if and when, I mean, when, uh, he's in his you know, advanced years, to put it mildly, when he goes, there are a few commentators who think that the relationship will get easier. Uh, we do maintain a security partnership. It has its ups and downs. It's definitely in both sides' interests. It's an incredibly problematic relationship with a very, very difficult partner who has certainly not used his years to explain to his people that the Jewish narrative gives them legitimacy here as well. I don't think many Israelis in the mainstream uh, expect the Palestinian leadership to say, you know what, the Jews have better claims to this part of the world than we do, but we're not going to, be, going to be able to make peace with them and build a lasting relationship until their leadership tells them that unfortunately there are people who claim to have, who, 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 who believe that they have credible claims to this part of the world. You know, we haven't seen Abbas depart from that 
narrative that he was bequeathed by his unlamented predecessor, Yasser Arafat, uh, of no Jewish legitimacy in, 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 in the ancient Jewish homeland. Uh, and, and yet, like I say, after him, it will probably get worse. That's the nature of the relationship that, you know, we could speak forever about this. And the, the, the key parameters don't change terribly, ra terribly, terribly rapidly. And to my mind, among the key parameters is that if we want to maintain Israel as a majority Jewish state and we want to maintain it as, a, as the incredible thriving democracy that it is, we have to find a way to separate from the Palestinians because there's maybe more than, maybe as many as, or maybe slightly fewer uh, um, non-Jews than Jews between the river and the sea, but it's almost the same. The numbers are almost the same. There are millions of people who are hostile to us. We have to try and find a way to separate from them. On the other hand, separating from them, relinquishing adjacent territory, as we are, we are have been rudely and, and murderously reminded, um, does not work, right? When we left Gaza, that was an opportunity for the Palestinians to build something viable and thriving in, in an area that we had relinquished, instead of which they used it to attack us and a terrorist organization took over. Um, had they maintained even a, a veneer of calm, we would have been tempted to relinquish parts of the West Bank. Instead, they told us, don't dare do it, because any territory you relinquish, we will use it as a base to further expedite, expedite our aggression against you. And therefore, we have this terrible dilemma. We want to separate. It's essential to our foundational character that we separate. And when we relinquish territory in the cause of trying to separate and to part with the Palestinians to viable independence for themselves, that is abused and we are attacked. And by the way, demonized internationally. So it's incredibly complicated and you knew all of that, but, and maybe you disagree with some of it, but though that's the, the, the incredibly complex framework in which we try to negotiate these relations with, with the Palestinians. Thank you, David. Now I hand over to Anthony Cohen. <clears throat> Thank you for your insights, David. Um, I was reading recently that Russia is potentially trying to, um, or suggesting that they help Syria rid themselves of any presence of Iranian military or personnel and uh, in uh, a reward for that, they'll build a whole lot of infrastructure in uh, Syria, but also encouraging Syria to take steps towards normalizing relations with Israel. Have you heard of that? Um, send me the URLs of, of, of credible material that you've seen on that. I'm interested. Um, it's not, you know, I don't know what to, I don't know what to say about that. It's clear that the that Russia is. I mean, there's, there's a few things that we know. We know that uh, Assad has survived the the a period where it seemed pretty clear that he that his country was fragmenting. Uh, he was butchering immense numbers of people. Um, incredible uh, array of profoundly unsavory forces were uh, engaged in Syria. Um, he's come through that. He seems to be um, rebuilding some kind of, well, there's some, there's some a degree of tolerance for him being there uh, that is growing um, among supposedly enlightened uh, Western nations. Uh, you, you can just see that. You can, you can, you can see it in, 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 in some of the things that are playing out. Uh, the notion that Assad is finished is certainly no longer uh, the assumption here. Uh, we know that Russia has been central to his survival, and we know that Russia has tolerated a degree of an Iranian involvement. Uh, we know that Iran is trying to deepen its involvement and that the Russians have, uh, have, have, are clearly not prepared to allow Iran to do everything that it wants to do in Syria. Those are some of the things we know. We know that Israel has this very interesting relationship with Russia. Um, where, where you know, people far more credible and knowledgeable than I am will tell you that, uh, that Putin is not an anti-Semite, which is quite striking, um, but he, and is not sort of instinctively hostile to Israel. You know, these are quite interesting uh, um, judgments to make, uh, aware that a million former Russians are citizens of Israel, um, has, has been helpful to Israel in certain contexts, but some of his key allies are some of our, our most bitter enemies. And, so, and therefore you have this incredibly complicated relationship. Uh, I, I don't know credibly, and I could be wrong, I don't know credibly that Russia 
I mean, that's so many steps beyond where we are now. I'm not saying it's impossible um, that Russia is um, kind of edging Assad into, into some kind of um, um, warming of ties with Israel. It seems so remote. Um, you know, we, we, we tried. We tried it uh, um, very seriously uh, 20 years ago or so. Um, and uh, I think there was some belief uh, 20 and, and more years ago. I'm talking about the Rabin era. I'm talking about the Netanyahu first uh, era, uh, Barak. You know, we, we negotiated via the United States. Um, and, and Assad senior was not prepared um, to make the viable compromises, I think Israelis would say, that would have enabled um, a, a gradual normalization of relations. You know, and that's, it, it, things have moved so far in the opposite direction, you know, most especially because of what's happened in Syria of late. And this is a country that, uh, that has been tearing itself apart and whose leadership has been so utterly um, mass murderously brutal to its own people. Uh, things change fast, the unpredictable can happen. Uh, you know, it will be a function of where Russia sees its interests. Uh, Israelis would, would, you know, we want to widen the circle of peace. We would like to have peace with all of our neighbors. They have to be credible relationships. They have to be relationships with leaderships that are, that are credible in terms of, of their own countries, right? You know, why did we make peace with, within weeks with the Jordanians um, a quarter century ago? Because here was somebody with a credible track record of quiet relations with Israel, who was in control of his country, was able to make the, 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 the concessions and, and the agreements that, uh, that came together incredibly quickly. So much goodwill, so much good faith on both sides at that time. You know, put that into the Syrian context. This, this, this president who, who by any international moral standards should be in, in jail as a, as, a, as a terrible war criminal, um, heading a country full of conflicting and conflicted forces. You know, what kind of credibility would he have as the leader of Syria in coming to any kind of negotiations with us? And yet, and yet we would seek to, to, to progress if we could. You know, there are, there are contacts with Lebanon that we have mediated by the United States over maritime issues. You know, we were, we, there, were, there, were year, there were periods not so many years ago when we thought, well, maybe things can advance with Lebanon. But the complexities, again, of, of these fragmented countries so riven by internal dissent uh, mean, and you're, you know, you're, these are incredibly sensitive. These are neighboring areas. And therefore, you know, there are, there are uh, you know, the, the potential for a, for a calm situation to become something very different massively complicates everything. You know, we saw what happened with Gaza. We've seen by contrast how effective those two major peace treaties that we had with Jordan and Egypt, how effective they have been, um, even in, in, in times in Egypt, when, the, when there was a leadership there that was um, ideologically hostile to Israel, the, the agreement held, we have the longest border of any of our borders with Jordan. That, that border is astoundingly um, calm in the, in the relative scheme of things. Can you imagine that there would be any sense that you could guarantee something similar on the Syrian border? And therefore, while we would, you know, while Israel would, 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 would love to try to, to advance any credible opportunity there, it seems to me, you know, implausible with, with that caveat that things can change very fast in this region. Thank you for that, David. I'll now hand over to Jamie Himes for the penultimate question. Thank you, Joel. Thanks, David. It's been fascinating. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a bit about Israel's um, foreign relations, perhaps more beyond the region than, than with you know, the countries you've mentioned, um, with the Abraham Accords and Egypt and Jordan. You know, Netanyahu achieved a lot in outreach to areas like South America and Africa and India and Eastern Europe, but on the other hand, alienated a lot of um, perhaps some of the West, Israel's Western allies. Um, there's concerns that Bennett might be similar, similarly alienating and Lapid might be so busy holding the coalition together, he doesn't really have time to you know, fulfill his role as a foreign minister as well as he might. So I'm just wondering what, how you assess the way the, the government is going about with Israel's foreign relations and, and where you see that heading. Thanks. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I look, I, I think I'll tell. I'll give you an example from something that's that's nothing to do with your question. You know, there's this huge issue that we have: Israel diaspora Jews, um, the so-called Kotel Compromise, right? The framework that was agreed 2016. There was going to be a guarantee. There is an area for pluralistic prayer to the right of the 
conventional Kotel as you look, but it was, it was going to be formalized with some kind of joint oversight role, in, including non-Orthodox streams of Judaism. And then it was suspended in 2017 uh, because of pressure from, um, from, from some extreme Orthodox and then ultra-Orthodox uh, um, political groups. So when we asked Matan Kahana about the Kotel compromise, which he backed, by the way, and thinks it should be revived, and then we sort of said, well, why haven't you done anything about it? He said, because you know, we haven't got to it yet. And I think that's a, a partial answer to your question. I think there's an awful lot that they haven't got to yet. They've been in power for, what is it, four or five months. And the key focus, because they were doomed otherwise, was on the budget. And the budget was really complicated. And I think it took, took up an immense amount of their time. And there's some truth in what you what you said about, you know, maybe Lapid has been preoccupied with many other things. I mean, he would be beyond superhuman if he was able to do everything that he wanted to do because he, he is, I'm not sure he's the glue that holds the coalition together, but he's he was the prime player who brought it together. And at any moment, I think if you take your eye off the ball, you know, one of these one of these pieces is, is going to you know fly off in, in, a, in a dangerous direction. I think that's an ongoing challenge. I think, you know, there's, there's a um, Knesset member, Edith Silman is her name, she's from Yamina, she's the coalition chair. Uh, how she held that, you know, you got 61, you had 62, one of them, we didn't even mention him, uh, but you know, there was a Yamina M MK who never voted with the government, including on the initial vote of confidence. So they lost one, they only had to lose one more and it was all over. So I, I think all of them have been preoccupied with survival until very recently. He has some good people around him, Lapid, and therefore the fact that he may be very strongly focused on domestic survival, domestic political survival, does not mean that there aren't people in that, in that foreign ministry who have been trying to look at areas where Israel can act smartly, develop relations, recalibrate relations, and so on. They will not be out to alienate anybody they can avoid alienating. You can you can be sure that they would want to improve Israel's standing um, in, a, in in parts of the world where uh, Netanyahu had alienated some uh, leaders and some parties within countries and so on. They you know they will be seeking to improve relations and they will want want to build on. And you're so right that the astoundingly um, heavy investment that Netanyahu made in trying to warm relations with countries. That, uh, that might have been neglected and that proved um, potentially ready to support Israel in certain diplomatic standoffs, certain votes and so on, you know, broadening of relations. Um, so they, they won't want to lose those and they will, they will want to, uh, to warm ties in areas where, where, they've, uh, where they've chilled. I, I don't, th I mean, Bennett, I think, would, would, would strongly um, reject the notion that he... Um, might consider a process of alienation. I think he would, he, you know, he's trying to be, he, he, would, he, would, he would want to be perceived as someone who's trying to warm relations where possible. And one of the huge challenges, and you probably feel it there, uh, certainly in the United States, right, this notion that Israel, in, in, a, in an era, I know I'm speaking at great length and I apologize, and I know we have to stop in a second, but we're in an era where, where uh, um, first of all, human nature seems to be, I mean, we seem to be, you know, heading off a cliff in terms of, of, of some of the ways that we interact as people. Um, and the notion of, of, uh, of bipartisan politics uh, in the United States, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's narrowing. Uh, there are very few issues that are bipartisan issues. And uh, the fact that uh, leaving aside blame doesn't matter um, uh, for the purpose of this argument. You had a president in the United States who was very supportive of Israel and who was very divisive in America. And therefore, even if everybody had acted as wisely as they possibly could, if you loathed Donald Trump and Donald Trump loved Israel, there was the danger that you would loathe Israel. Um, that's a you know, sort of very crude summary. And some of that needs to be recalibrated. Israel is deserving and needs um, bipartisan mainstream support in the United States and, and around the world. You know, we're, we're, we deserve the support of, of, of well-intentioned uh, pro-democracy uh, people. Uh, and that, I think, is, you know, the broad the broad goal there will be to strengthen those relations and, 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 and ensure that um, that people who may have been alienated, if they can be won back again within the mainstream, people who are who take reasonable positions. And I think that Bennett and Lapid would both say that's their goal. And um, and uh, these are early days in trying to achieve it. Thank you for that, David. Now for the final question, we've hit the 60 minute mark. We'll hand over back to Colin for the final question. 
Thanks very much, Joel. And uh, David, I'll take the opportunity to thank you for a very insightful, uh, thoughtful, uh, perceptive presentation, as we expected. Double barrel question to end up on, particularly from the perspective of, uh, of Australia. Uh, just adding on to Jamie's question and Israel's sort of standing in international affairs and approach to international affairs. I mean, the fact of the matter is, certainly from our uh, perspective here, um, I mean, the centre of a lot of the global politics has shifted to the Indo-Pacific. And for both Australia in particular, obviously the United States, this is clearly the case. And it's the rise and the change in the behaviour of China over the last decade, having become much more aggressive. I'm wondering if you could comment or thought about the extent to which Israel, which has made such great gains in building coalitions and support within the Middle East, uh, has really factored uh, this issue into its outlook. I mean, obviously, India has been a major plus, uh, but China is also uh, heavily involved in the economy of Israel, as it is in Australia. But the negative sides of that involvement, and certainly China's role in bailing out and supporting Iran, as one example, in the Middle East, do you think is the, the Israeli policymakers and this government has got so many problems to deal with, but is it starting to get its head around this issue? And I wonder if you have any thoughts about how Israel is adjusting to the China factor and the China challenge. And the second one, of course, is uh, the pandemic. Uh, Israel, of course, has uh, had a very interesting experience. I'm wondering if you could say something about uh, the mood in Israel, the lessons that could be drawn from uh, how it's handled uh, this emergency, the impact on its thriving democracy, the viability of the country, certainly its social harmony, its resilience. I mean, it's certainly been getting a lot of publicity, mainly positive, I have to say. Uh, but I wonder if you could give us your thoughts on, on any lessons to be learned there. Okay, I'm, I'm much um, smarter on the second of those, but on the first of those, um, I think there's an awareness in Israel that you said that about China, but I think you know, with India too, to some extent, you know, you look, who, are the, who are the other allies of the people that we're trying to deepen relationships with? And we know that where China and where India is concerned, some of their other allies, are people who are, who are profoundly hostile to Israel. We know, for example, you know, Modi um, immediately after uh, interacting personally with Netanyahu was also hosting Rouhani. So there's there's an awareness there. I, I think um, there, there may have been and there may be some a degree of naivety in an Israel that, that wants to deepen relations, broadly speaking, where it can. And there's been a sense of, uh, well, two ancient peoples, um, I'm talking about in, Israel and China here, um, underestimated by the international community, thriving and so on. I think that there, there may have been some naivety about um, the, 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 the other interests and the, the, like I said, the other alliances of people that we're trying to build relations with. And, and of course, there, there's the potential, especially where China is concerned, for friction with the United States as we deepen our relations. Um, so I, th I think people have become increasingly aware of that and aware of the sensitivities and in areas where they weren't aware, Sometimes the United States has not been shy about um, about making the point. You know, you you know, you should not be deepening relations with China in this area. You shouldn't be uh, giving them uh, um, the influence that they have in that area. I think it's ongoing. I think that there that some of the uh, earlier naivety has probably been replaced by a, by a greater awareness of some of the wider international forces um, on COVID, and that's a really nice place to end. Okay. Um, and, I, and I imagine it's interesting. And I was, by the way, I was just in Britain um, and I was and, and I had a very nice break in Britain. It was uh, it was um, only minor for work, m mainly an opportunity to have a, to have a, bit, of, a, a bit of a break and coming from Israel to, to, to England. And then you'll you'll get a sense of where you guys fit in on this, which I don't know directly. Obviously, I was struck by how open everything was. But without without the the precautions that we seem to be relatively good at taking in Israel, um, I was on the underground on the tube in London. Elder, uh, older people were wearing masks. Younger people, almost without exception, were not. I was struck by um, uh, how absent mask wearing was in uh, in many places where it would have been um, the norm in Israel. Um, here. First of all, we did, as you know, we did really well initially on the vaccinations and we've kind of slowed. We, there's, there was talk a few months ago of about a million Israelis out of the 9.3 or 4 million that we are um, eligible and not vaccinated. I don't think that number has fallen dramatically. In other words, there's, 
close to a million Israel, eligible Israelis who, who chose not to vaccinate. Um, if you look at the numbers now, they're on our website. You can go and you can see the numbers all the time. Um, you know, I think that we, 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 we never reached six million. We didn't reach six million yet. Um, and uh, when you look then at the booster, right? So we've had the first and the second. Now we, we're, we're many, many weeks into the availability of the third. And if you look at the timing, most of the people who've had the first and second vaccines are well eligible for the third vaccine. And yet the third vaccine is only at the four million mark. So somewhere in, in recent months, something in excess of a million and a half Israelis have declined or have not rushed to get their third shot. Um, so I don't know what to make of that. Uh, in terms of early vaccination, great. In terms of the speed with which we, which we got most people vaccinated, great. In terms of the speed with which the third vaccine was made available and the initial take up pretty good and, and, and not so good of late. I, I think you can see a certain stalling you know, people who are better at statistics than I am will make uh, will make their own judgments. I, I think that's going to be a global phenomenon, by the way. I think the more people hear, oh, look, Pfizer's developing a, fi- a, a pill that uh, is 90 percent or 89 percent effective in um, confronting serious illness and, and, and avoiding fatality. The more people hear that, even if it is not approved, uh, you, you will. I think you'll find greater proportions, proportions of, of wary people saying, well, maybe I won't get that latest booster shot. You know, I, I, I personally rushed to get my third booster um, and encourage people to do the same. This is not me speaking. That's me, this is me assessing. Um, in terms of the economy, the economy has, has been astoundingly resilient and, uh, and has and, and innovative in the COVID era as well, by the way. The wider statistics of our economy are, are incredibly strong. The amount of investment coming into Israel um, we've, we've had some, some pieces on this. Israel may be transitioning from a startup nation to a scale-up nation where countries are not, it's not only these sort of quirky little niches that Israeli firms are filling, but increasingly um, heavier weight firms that are capable of developing with, with very, very strong business models. Uh, so there's very encouraging stuff that on the, on the currency level, you see that playing out. <clears throat> the shekel has not, has not been stronger against the dollar for a quarter of a century uh, because there's so much investment coming in and other factors as well. Uh, and part of that is COVID related. And now on COVID, and this is obviously relevant to you, we're uh, opening up to some degree to tourism. Uh, again, you know your restrictions better than I do. Uh, it's not a slam dunk in any, in any degree because Europe is in, in increasingly high COVID rates in some parts of Europe. We're talking about, let's talk now about reintroducing restrictions. Uh, on, on travel to and from Europe at the same time as there's been this sort of gradual, very complicated procedures whereby some tour groups can come in and so on. So we're, we're in the middle ground there. It's not clear to me if we're going to continue easing up or whether we're going to lock down a little bit more in terms of tourism. Locking down as an economy, though, we've avoided now. We were, we were big lockdown people in the Netanyahu era. And one of Bennett's chief things was, I'm not going to lock down the economy. I think you have to conclude that there's probably been more deaths in Israel in the last few months than there would have been if we'd had a completely locked down economy. On the other hand, without wishing to sound crude and brutal, and I really don't, uh, a very high proportion of the, of the serious cases have increasingly been among people who don't vaccinate. Um, that, you know, so those are some glimpses of our reality. I know there are, you know, I think every country handles this in, in sometimes quite dramatically different ways. Uh, the Israeli process seems to have been pretty good. If what we're seeing now is Europe dealing with a, with a Delta variant related wave, which we kind of think we got through, then, then, then we can aff- afford to feel that we did pretty well. But we know, you know, almost two years into this pandemic that it still has the potential to surprise you for the worse. And you, you hope that all the advances being made in terms of vaccination and ultimately in terms of, of, of medicines that can confront this, uh, you have to hope that they're going to beat the, the evolution of this pandemic, which the experts tell us, you know, until much of the world um, has beaten it, that, you know, the potential for it to mutate and for new variants remains with us. So I, I want to try, you know, we didn't even talk about the environment where, um, where we're all facing, uh, you know, potential catastrophe. So we've got great environmental challenges, great pandemic challenges, you know, within the parameters um, 
we're doing pretty well in Israel, certainly relatively speaking where COVID is concerned in terms of environmental awareness, which I, I would like to raise, you know, becoming more aware with lots of things that we need to confront. We had wildfires here in the last few days. We're watching the Dead Sea ebb away, but let's try and end on, on that positive note about COVID because there are COVID and the economy. I would say, and a degree of political stability. Wow, I'm just coming up with good things all the time, where there are encouraging things to say at the end of, uh, of this call. Thank you very much for that, David. It was a fascinating presentation. Uh, we're all better off for the past hour of, of being on the call with you. Uh, as I told you at the top of the hour, it's been a long time since we've been able to travel to Israel. So you've covered off so many things that uh, you know we generally would have known by being able to be on the ground there. And you really have covered all bases for us tonight. So on behalf of Team AJAC, everyone at AJAC, thank you so much for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for tonight. We will have our next webinar next week, Wednesday at 12.30. That's the 24th of November, 12.30 p.m. with Dr. Jonathan Shanza to promote his new book. Until then, good night, stay safe, and we'll see you then.